what are the welfare implications of satisfying people's true preferences if they don't recognize that, that they are their true preferences? Does it make them happier? In fact, it might make them worse off. If somebody doesn't realize that his or her true preferences are not to eat junk food, but thinks that their true preferences are to eat junk food, then putting a tax on junk food or somehow inhibiting them from eating junk food doesn't make them happier, it makes them worse off. I'm Mario Rizzo. I'm a professor of economics at New York University and the co-director of the Classical Liberal Institute at the New York University School of Law. I thought that behavioral economics in some ways was a refreshing development in economics because a lot of things had been taken for granted in the, in the standard neoclassical approach, which I thought should be questioned and should, should not be taken for granted. But they connected it uh, very uh, closely with a kind of policy agenda. So what I wanted to do was to see whether the policy agenda really followed from the behavioral foundations that they were laying and uh, just sort it all out in terms of uh, the theory and in, and in terms of policy agenda. I would say the behavioral economics, the fundamental concept of behavioral economics is something called decision-making failure. In standard economics, we have a notion of market failure, when markets don't work well to satisfy the uh, preferences of consumers. And there are many cases, monopoly, externalities, whatever. But this is a case of decision-making failure. That is to say, when individuals do not make decisions that are consistent with their own best interests. And so I think that's the core of behavioral uh, economics, is decision-making failure. What follows from that uh, is the behavioral policy uh, analysis. In fact, there's a journal called uh, Behavioral Public Policy, which is devoted to the policy implications of the idea of decision-making failure. The behavioral uh, biases that have been uh, cataloged by this Wikipedia page called Cognitive Biases uh, amount to about 175. Now, uh, in all fairness, uh, the biases listed are not all separate from each other, but it gives you a sense of the behavioral literature, not only behavioral economics, but the cognitive science literature, which has developed this idea of biases, how many they have come up with. So there are many biases. I think uh, probably the most important of these biases uh, is something called present bias. And present bias is the idea uh, that people when they're making decisions for the farther future, tend to make quote-unquote rational decisions. But when these decisions are upfront, when they refer to, uh, say, the next period, we, the people tend to be myopic and they tend to uh, make decisions which are only in their short-run interests. So it's this conflict between kind of short-run interest and long-run interest with the bias being the the short-run interest that's taken the focus of uh, behavioral economics, I think. There are many others, uh, but I, I think I, I would say that's the central bias. What uh, behavioral economists uh, used to call new paternalism, uh, they're now calling uh, behavioral paternalism. And behavioral paternalism differs from the classic form of paternalism insofar as the classic form of paternalism was not about uh, a person's own true preferences. It was about some objective criterion for what is good for a person. And sometimes it was a moral paternalism. You know, you should go to church on Sunday. Or sometimes it was a health paternalism, but it had to do with some objective criteria. Behavioral paternalism is a little different. It, it purports to be about not objective criteria, but the true preferences of individuals, uh, what they really want to do, not what uh, somebody else thinks they should do. So it's still rooted in a kind of uh, traditional economics framework, but has to do with preferences that people would have if they were free of biases. So it's this sort of bias-free uh, preference now, the issue, of course, is how do you discover bias-free uh, preferences? And that's where a lot of the debate is uh, today, how easy it is to discover these and, uh, and whether behavioral economists have been successful.
Now, I've argued, uh, among other things, that it is quite difficult to, in fact, determine bias-free preferences, probably in part because there are so many biases. So one would have to uh, systematically investigate a situation to determine uh, whether uh, various biases are present. So you go through a, essentially a checklist. And it would be a lot of things to sort of check off. Unfortunately, in most of the analysis, people seem to be content with analyzing one or two biases and therefore coming to rather simple conclusions about what bias-free preferences uh, would be. So there are really uh, important epistemic problems here uh, that I think need to be further explored. In the junk food area, there would be the so-called uh, fat tax or soda tax. It depends on what kind of junk food you're talking about. There are some jurisdictions which have a tax on the sugar content of, uh, of soft drinks or non-alcoholic drinks. So what those see, uh, are, are supposed to do is supposed to dissuade people from drinking uh, sugar-sweetened uh, drinks with the idea that that will help the, uh, the obesity problem. Uh, interestingly enough, there have been studies that try to investigate whether uh, these uh, uh, taxes or other nudges away from junk foods do any good, and there's no real evidence that it does. Partly it's because, for example, in the soda case, uh, people switch to uh, artificially sweetened sodas. Artificially sweetened sodas, if you hold everything else constant, will cause you to lose weight. But in fact, they don't satisfy your appetite as much. People tend to eat more. Uh, they feel it's a license to eat more. And so everything is not constant. And in fact, people who consume the sodas are not uh, more likely to uh, control their obesity problem than anybody else. There are other examples. Um, one example, which is a little bit strange because it doesn't really involve government, is uh, setting up a, a default of automatic enrollment in retirement savings programs. Now, the background is this. Many large employers have employer-sponsored uh, retirement programs. It used to be that you had to opt in to get to, to be a part of the program, so that if you did nothing, you were not in the program. In recent years, more firms have uh, developed this idea of automatic enrollment. So if you do nothing, you're enrolled and you're enrolled at a certain rate in a certain uh, retirement vehicle. Now, the way it comes into behavioral economics is not in the, as I say, in terms of government policy, but in the idea that this, in fact, is the reason that uh, there has been greater enrollment in these uh, programs uh, over recent years, automatic enrollment. Because it would seem that, what's the difference? If you could sign in or sign out, it's all very simple. But behavioral economists have claimed it's due to some behavioral nudge that uh, people are greater enrolled. We have argued it's due to more information and uh, a recommendation on the part of employers that is uh, manifest in the automatic enrollment. So people are doing it for, we claim, purely rational reasons and not for behavioral nudge reasons. In economics, there are certain criteria that decision makers have to fulfill in order to be considered rational. And one of the criteria is that uh, they have to have a complete preference ordering. In other words, they have to have an opinion, a clear-cut opinion about every option in front of them. Other criteria are that they uh, have to be consistent in their choices. And you go on and on with a number of other uh, criteria. Now, the behavioral economists quite reasonably say People aren't like that. They don't behave in accordance with all these rationality criteria. They're not mechanical, you know, economic men or women. Uh, and so it doesn't make any sense from a, uh, a descriptive point of view. But, and then they don't say this explicitly, but they, they in effect hold to this, that this is the way people should behave. So the goal of, pro uh, of policy is to incentivize people to behave as rational economic agents. And we think that's too narrow. There are plenty of reasons why people might be inconsistent in their choice. That doesn't make them irrational. Uh, it may be that they're experimenting with different options. It may be that they haven't decided what they want to do, and so on and so forth. So we think from, in, in that sense, the behavioral economists have an incomplete revolution 
the complete revolution would be to reject the rationality criteria even at the level of normativity as well as the descriptive level. Inclusive rationality is the idea that we ought to be broader about what we consider reasonable behavior. So that reasonable behavior ought to be the standard, not technically rational behavior. And as I say, reasonable behavior uh, could be simply that a person has not fully decided what they want to do and that's why they're inconsistent. That's reasonable in a world of high information costs and things of that sort. An interesting, uh, there's an economist by the name of uh, Itzhak Gilboa, I think is his name, who says his favorite definition of rationality is if you can give reasons for your choice that don't make people laugh, then he says, then that's a reasonable choice that you've made and he would consider that rational. I tend to go along with that joke. Some uh, uh, psychologists have actually, uh, and we discussed some of this, have argued that there is a functional value to biases. Um, that sometimes biases can uh, inhibit people from making decisions that they otherwise uh, would not want to make. For example, some biases cause people to procrastinate in their decisions. Now, procrastination could be viewed as a bad thing, or it could be viewed as time out. George Ansley, a psychologist, uh, a very prominent psychologist, has argued that many of the biases have functional value and they are uh, important and do contribute to people's broader rationality. Uh, that's a whole other approach, uh, but I think it has a lot of validity. I think that uh, Knight's contribution uh, is important here because most uh, economists, both behavioral and uh, neoclassical, uh, like to model all condi conditions of uncertainty as if they were uh, purely risk, so that the probability distribution is known. Now this comes out in, in, in implicitly in the idea, for example, that certain uh, uh, habits like uh, eating junk food or smoking, etc., are bad for your health in the context of young people. In order to make a, an appropriate economic decision as to whether to eat junk food, for example, or not, in view of the health risks, one has to have some sense of what the health risks are going to be 20, 30, 40 years from now for a typical 20-year-old. Uh, uh, and this is not something which is e determinable by a fixed and objective probability distrib distribution. We don't know the future course of medical technology. For example, people in 1960 uh, who were obese were in much worse health than people today who are obese because of all the drugs and various other medical procedures that we have now. Who knows what people who are obese in the year 2050 or 2060 are going to be like in terms of health and therefore what the real risks are of these habits today. So in one sense, uh, the, the Knightian approach warns us not to assume that we know uh, what the unique rational decision is for decisions for young people, for example, in, in smoking or eating junk food. It cautions us that there may be more than one quote-unquote reasonable decision to make under these conditions of, of radical uncertainty. There is a, a distinction that uh, psychologists have made between uh, sources of uh, self-control external and internal sources of self-control. I think the terms are kind of self-explanatory. So internal uh, self-control, uh, a person comes to the recognition that a certain behavior is bad or uh, either their health or morally, etc., and they exercise willpower and, and self-control. Even before you get to self-control, there's something called a, a broader concept of self-regulation. Self-regulation is not uh, the immediate sort of stealing yourself, uh, you know, against the chocolate cake, but it is more subtle. Uh, you don't go to restaurants that serve a delicious chocolate cake, or you put the chocolate cake on the top shelf where it's inconvenient to get and it reminds you not to get it, things of that sort. So that's internal forms of uh, self-control or self-regulation. External is somebody sort of 
uh, scolds you, or uh, there's a tax on, 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 on the sugar, or whatever, coming from the outside. Now, the relevance of this is that psychologists have done studies that indicate that self uh, external control and uh, internal control are treated by people as substitutes. The more there is external control, the less they deal, uh, they engage in internal control. So what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is that it has also been found that the substitution of, uh, or the reduction of, of internal control doesn't only occur in the area where there's the external uh, control. It generalizes. In other words, people become more accustomed to leaving it to somebody else. So that there have been experiments that show that in completely unrelated areas, when people were subject to external control, their self-control was reduced, and vice versa. I have to admit the, the, the research is not definitive, but it could actually lead to a condition where people are less able to uh, do for themselves than they were prior to the nudges and, and paternalism. The political economy of uh, paternalism is uh, is fraught, really, because it oftentimes, it politically, is a combination of uh, what we call, and has been called in the uh, literature, the coalition of the bootleggers and the Baptists. The Baptists uh, mean the people who are truly concerned with uh, making people better, in some sense, morally or, or here, health-wise, for example. And the bootleggers are the people who have some special interests uh, to gain out of, the, uh, out of the policy. I would add a third uh, category, and that's the category of the clueless voter. The clueless voter uh, doesn't really know what the correct amount of uh, junk food eating should be according to behavioral econo economics and its standards. It's clearly not zero because they admit that people get pleasure from this. So it would tend to be the case that in, in political terms, it's never enough. In other words, you could always say that as long as people are eating junk food, uh, we should do more uh, to intervene. And when the tax isn't enough, then you, the temptation for harder forms of intervention uh, are, are present. And so the idea is that because the standard is so hard to uh, determine in practice that politically it will tend to be simplified into all or nothing and therefore become more severe in its paternalistic aspects. There are uh, groups of economists uh, who uh, want to uh, reanalyze and reevaluate uh, the notions of rationality that have come down to us. They tend to be uh, not in the mainstream, by and large. Uh, I know INET, for example, has many economists who are interested in this sort of evaluation. The Austrian School of Economics has people, and even behavioral economists. I mean, there are some behavioral economists who are not particularly happy with the pol public policy aspect. So I think there is a growing group of economists outside the mainstream who are interested in reevaluating these ideas. I think ultimately the mainstream will get the message, but I'm not sure uh, when and how. For a young person thinking of entering economics, I think it's important that they understand and learn well the mainstream approaches. But that they take away from that some sort of critical faculty, that is to say they take away from that uh, the idea that th although this is the established uh, mainstream approach, it is not perfect, there are good arguments against it, and maybe th th to think about how they and their careers could improve uh, the approaches that economists take. But I think it's vital for every economic student to have a, a you know, PhD economic student to have a good, solid background on what the contemporary approach is. I know Milton Friedman used to say about Keynesianism, he said, you have to understand Keynesianism better than the Keynesians in order to criticize it. So you have to understand standard neoclassical economics better than they do in order to criticize it.